Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this DNA Day event and celebrating DNA Day with us. My name is Maggie O'Day, and this is my colleague, Jordan Thompson. And we're here from Ontario Genomics, representing this with uh, Let's Talk Science, which is a Canadian organization which gets students like you just as excited about science as we are. So we at Ontario Genomics are a enabler organization. So what we do is we spark science innovation at the researcher's level at the bench, and then we also connect it to um, the industries and the partners all across Canada. And our research is based on genomics. Okay, thanks Maggie. And today we're gonna to talk about an aspect of genomics called synthetic biology. So I'm gonna turn it over to Justin and Julie from Amino Labs and Halliburton, and they're gonna tell you about some of the cool stuff they're doing in synthetic biology. Okay, Justin and Julie, go ahead. Great, thanks. So synthetic biology is a, a very exciting topic and we're gonna give an introduction uh, about it and kind of leave it at the high level. Uh, and so I'm gonna start screen sharing here. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about synthetic biology. So it's DNA day today and at the core of synthetic biology, this, this discipline where we program DNA and we manipulate the DNA within living organisms to create interesting products, uh, we have the DNA double helix here. And yeah, this is, this is the center of it all. And DNA is really amazing because uh, you can look into the ocean to the largest creatures on our planet as they just float through the ocean. Uh, and then you can look at even the smallest organisms that exist on our planet, and they exist in our bodies, on our skin, uh, and they're microscopic. You can't even see them unless you have a microscope uh, to larger organisms, such as yeast cells, which are more complex than bacteria, uh, but they're still quite simple. Uh, and we use them to brew beer and wine and make bread, uh, all the way to more complex organisms like birds. And you can see here, there's a, a male bird doing a funny dance for a female bird. And, and it's important to remember that when we look at all of these different organisms, from microorganisms to mammals to birds, all the way to us, DNA is really the information and it's it's the programming that tells the cells how to do stuff how to make things and how to interact with other things in its environment and so we like to think of uh, cells especially microorganisms as little micro factories and by changing the dna within these little micro factories you can cause the cells to create interesting products and have interesting traits. Uh, and uh, one of the first examples, and this was actually the first modern biotechnology product, was uh, a compound called insulin. And insulin and diabetes ha has a long history with, uh, within uh, our society. Dating back to the early 1900s, a lot of people were sick for unknown causes. And then in the 1920s, some scientists in Toronto actually identified the cause, the root cause, and, and actually the solution to the problem, which was insulin. And once this was identified, uh, organs were harvested from animals, and then the insulin, which is the drug, uh, was collected and purified and used as a treatment. And it wasn't until the 1970s when some scientists and when biotechnology really started to pick up, when some scientists said, hey, why don't we take the DNA code from a human that encodes for insulin and let's put it into a bacteria and have the bacteria produce it for us. And they were successful. And this is actually how most modern medicine is made today. It's, it's the result of getting some DNA from a human or another organism or making it from scratch and then putting it into another organism like a yeast or a bacteria and then having those microorganisms make it for us. Uh, and this actually goes way beyond medicine. It goes into our everyday lives. Uh, and this is one example where laundry detergent and other soaps, uh, some of the components within them 
are made using microorganisms. So when you go home today, or even if you're going to the washroom, have a look at the ingredients on the back of a soap bottle, and you might see something called sodium laureth sulfate, which is the bubbling agent. It's the active agent in soap. And that's uh, made in large quantities using microorganisms today. I'm going to quickly pass it over to Julie here, and she's going to talk about a different side of synthetic biology. So synthetic biology, um, I'm going to talk to you more about the design approach in synthetic biology. And to me, that's really important because that's how the democratization of synthetic biology and bioengineering as a general science is happening in the world. So on screen, you can see these ice cream cones. And the reason they're there is just like we can make medicine and uh, industrial compounds with synthetic biology, we can also make flavors and pigments. And so right now, a lot of the vanilla flavors we eat is made using synthetic biology. And also a lot of the perfumes we wear, so rose rose oil, for example, that's very hard to get in nature and it's very costly to the environment and the people making it. So they found a way to isolate the scent compound from roses and produce those in yeast, which gives better yield, but is also a lot less toxic. So that's very important. And from um, that fundamental research is where I got interested in synthetic biology. So my background's in design not at all in science and it's very fascinating to me this synthetic biology because it does mean that designers can have a part in science so on screen you just see uh, these are regular bacteria they're not engineered but this was my first view of synthetic biology and bacteria is that they can be very beautiful and a lot of other designers and artists are seeing that as well um, there's a new contest for the last few years where using petri dishes you get to paint with bacteria and create these canvases, and now it's uh, become a worldwide phenomenon. From there, a lot of artists and designers are discovering biology and synthetic biology, and this is work by Natasha Obre of Faber Future, and she's a textile artist, and she, got, she discovered the pigments that can be produced either naturally in bacteria or through synthetic biology. And using these pigments, she, um, dyes fabrics and this shows a different side of how you can use these pigments because they're non-toxic and they're sustainable for the environment as opposed to the chemical dyes we use today um, and furthermore she uses the fabric in the petri dish itself which creates the pattern in the fabric so she's getting a living organism to do all the work and then gets these really beautiful fabrics that have added value you can also use the bacteria to create the fabric itself. This is a type of bacteria that produces cellulose, which is a sh type of sheet material that you can dry. And there's a company in New York called Modern Meadows, and what they're doing is they're looking at leather and how we can reinvent leather using bacteria. So they start with a natural bacteria, but then they engineer it using synthetic biology to produce garments. And this is very powerful if you think of the way we currently produce leather and a lot of different synthetic fabrics. Furthermore, there's a lot of research that's being done in institution that isn't necessarily ready for public consumption, but that's really inspiring. So certain bacteria in nature or through synthetic modification can change shape depending on their environment. And this is being this is being used by a group at MIT Media Lab, and they're using the property of the bacteria to change the property of the surface it's coated on. So this bacteria changes shape depending on if it's dry or humid, and you can see using uh, water sprays that the bacteria actually changes the property of the material itself. And they're looking at how can we include this in garments, for example, so looking at a heat map and a sweat map of an, or, um, <clears throat> sorry, of an sports runner, <laughs> they coat the fabric and make little uh, openings in the fabric itself so that the runner and um, the sports person can change his or her um, ability to, to perspire. Uh, finally, I'm going to show you one of the more speculative side of uh, the 
work that's being done right now. So this is eChromi, and it's part of the iGEM competition. Um, and this is something that I hope someone will talk about in this presentation or that we can address in question. So through iGEM, you create a team. And this team was made up of designers and scientists. And what they did is they created a bacteria that would change depending on your digestive tract's health and uh, would give you information when you go to the bathroom if you are healthy or if you should go consult a doctor. And so this was very powerful in changing the way that uh, we see consumers interacting with synthetic biology. Okay, we're gonna stop screen sharing here. We're gonna come back to us and we're gonna just show you a little bit of uh, synthetic biology on the go. I'm going to switch cameras here quickly. There we go. Okay, so we're going to show you a little bit. So we've been talking about bacteria, and we've been talking about uh, other organisms, but what do they actually look like when you engineer them? And so one of the things that we do here at Amino is we make it easy for you to try doing genetic engineering and synthetic biology yourself. And so there's a lot of colors and, that we saw earlier in the presentation. But these are examples of bacteria that you can try and engineer yourself. So normally E. coli bacteria are white in color and they're not normally colorful. And what you can do here is you can actually program them, meaning take some DNA that comes from another organism and you can put that DNA into the E. coli cells to cause them to do something interesting like change color. And so you can see uh, there's purples and blues and teals and, and there's a lot of other colors that you can do and a lot of them actually glow in the dark. And so that's kind of the, the foundation of synthetic biology is being able to program cells using DNA to do interesting things. And I think we'll leave it at that there. We've reached almost 10 minutes. And so we're going to pass it back to Ontario Genomics uh, to uh, introduce the next speaker. Okay, thanks, Justin and Julie. That was really, uh, really interesting. Um, I'm going to now introduce Katarina Jane, and she's from the University of Toronto iGEM team. And Justin and Julie just alluded to that, and I think she's going to tell you a little bit more about her experience there. Okay, go ahead, Katarina. Hi, hey guys. I'll just uh, start the screen share here. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, like we've said, I'm currently the co-president of iGEM Toronto. And uh, iGEM stands for International Genetically Engineered Machine. And the iGEM competition was founded in MIT and has since grown to include over 300 teams from across the world. Um, every year, students design and execute research projects to tackle real-world problems using synthetic biology. So in the fall, teams present their projects at the Grand Jamboree in Boston, Massachusetts. So considering that synthetic biology has the potential for a multitude of applications, uh, the iGEM competition has a, a variety of tracks that teams can compete within. Other than the medicine, the energy, and the environment tracks, teams can also register under art and design, food, industry, and hardware tracks, among others. So, how does an iGEM team go about solving a problem? So the iGEM Foundation has a registry of parts. Uh, conceptually, you can think of these as DNA Lego blocks. And these Lego blocks can be assembled into uh, devices that can perform a specific function. And a synthetic biologist can swap out different parts to mediate different functions. And what this looks like in practice is over here we have a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. And it is commonly used as a vector, or in other words, as a carrier for these assembled devices. And plasmids can then be inserted into organisms like yeast and E. coli to create synthetic organisms that are then capable of carrying out our desired functions. A little bit about how an iGEM team is structured. Um, here at iGEM Toronto, we take an interdisciplinary approach. So we have three main sub-teams. We have a computational team, a policy and practices team, and an experimental or a wet lab team. And what the wet lab is focusing on is designing, building, and assaying our parts. 
and the Dwana Ben uh, models them computationally. And the policy and practices team is focused on the public outreach and policy surrounding the synthetic biology and the research application of our project. Um, a little bit just broadly about our last year's project. So what we did was we focused on designing parts that would respond to gold in the environment and produce a color change, so from yellow to purple. And um, so we use the system called cell-free systems. And what this is, it's the contents of a cell. So the most important parts, the cellular machinery and other factors that are required, all separate from the cell. And we like to call this like the zombie mix. And previous research has shown that this mixture can be embedded onto a paper. Essentially, what this means is that you can activate your biological part on paper and see the paper change from gold to uh, purple in the response to gold in the environment. And what the computational team did was they created an app, a camera app, that can quantify the color change. And the policy and practices team investigated the application of the project to gold mining for the detection of gold particles in the environment. And now I guess I want to talk about um, some of my favorite IGEM projects from other teams. So one of my favorites is IGEM Cambridge 2010. And they worked with bioluminescence. So basically this is some organisms such as fireflies or jellyfish are endogenously able to produce light thanks to you, certain genes called the Lux genes. And what this team did is that they took a plasmid with these Lux genes and they were able to engineer a bioluminescent E. coli bacteria, which they then called E. gloli. And some scientists have uh, decided to take this even further, and this is a Kickstarter here, the glowing plant. So they've engineered bioluminescent plants. And what some researchers actually envision is the use of bioluminescent plants or trees as either replacement or to supplement streetlights. And uh, I think we already mentioned a bit about um, of the use of synthetic biology for perfume, but this is another cool project from IGEM 2014 Paris, and they focused on the human skin microbiome. So specifically, um, all the bacteria in your skin, um, basically they produce an unpleasant odors as a result of their um, metabolism. So these metabolic byproducts are basically what cause human body odor. And the idea here is that if we were able to engineer the skin microbiome to reduce pleasant instead of unpleasant scents, you could potentially um, maybe even replace deodorants. So this team engineered certain strains of bacteria to produce these scents, such as uh, lemon, butter, flour, jasmine, mint, and rain. Um, and um, here you have the plasma, you can see where the odor cassette set responsible for the the, um, the enzyme that would produce these scents. So interesting enough, like was mentioned, certain companies such as Ginkgo actually cultivate organisms that are able to produce these compounds, um, which are then sold to perfume companies. So I guess just to finish off, um, a big thanks to Ontario Genomics, who actually supports all of the different iGen teams in Ontario, and there's a lot of them. And if you're interested, a lot of these iGen teams actually have uh, summer um, outreach camps, um, so be sure to look forward to those. Uh, and I think that's it, so thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Katarina. That was great to, to talk about your experience with iGEM and some of the cool projects there. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Dr. Mark Kosnanski here at Ontario Genomics, so he's the president and CEO here, and he's going to talk to you about synthetic biology. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the promise and the effect of synthetic biology and, and why uh, you all should be sticking with your STEM education uh, and uh, eventually be uh, looking at synthetic biology as a, uh, as a career. Now, uh, Charles Dickens in his book, A Tale of Two Cities, starts by saying it was the worst of times, it was the best of times. I, I want to talk about the bad stuff for just a moment and then the excitement of how you, we, are going to solve some of those problems. So the bad stuff is that we still haven't been able to, to cure a whole bunch of different cancers. Uh, viruses like Ebola and Zika uh, are still terrifying 
and, and, and hurting a lot of people across the world. Uh, we have major problems in, in our food supply, and there are people around the world who are starving. And finally, uh, despite uh, Mr. Trump's uh, insistence that it doesn't exist, uh, we clearly have problems with, with, with climate change and, ha and how we're going to deal with that. Uh, the exciting thing is that the convergence of the computer technologies and biology or DNA sciences uh, are resulting in some promising solutions. Now, one of our heroes, Stephen Jobs, the inventor of the Apple and the iPhone, uh, said just before he died that the 21st century belongs to the convergence of information technologies, i.e. the computer and, and biology. And it's our abil ability to use information from biology, from DNA, and the speed and the power of computers that is allowing us to do a whole bunch of things that we never were able to dream of. So right now it takes a long time to uh, discover genetic differences in, in, in cancers uh, and develop drugs against it. We have in, 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 our, in our power today the ability to sequence uh, uh, cancer cells in minutes uh, with hundreds of dollars rather than the billions of dollars in years that it took not too, not too long ago. We have the ability to create viruses that will attack cancer cells specifically. So we have hope from synthetic biology that we're going to be able to solve some of those terrible human uh, uh, dilemmas that we find ourselves in, in terms of our health. And the same fits onto the food side. Uh, we can now create food that is healthier, pest resistant, drought resistant, with different flavors. And if and when we go to Mars, we're actually going to be able to bring food to Mars, not as food, but as, uh, in fact, as, uh, as, as DNA code, and then grow the food, whatever food we want, uh, on Mars, uh, and of course, we can do similar things here on Earth to allow for more, better, and healthier food uh, to feed an ever-increasing population. And then there's the issue of climate change. Well, one of the biggest producers of climate change are our, our gasoline-driven cars and the huge energy required to produce food. Uh, what if we could use microbes to fertilize food? rather than potash from mines. That would be a tremendously more efficient and it would be energy energetically very, very efficient, producing fewer greenhouse gases and uh, uh, solving many of our problems in climate change. So these are all initiatives in synthetic biology that three or four years ago were a sort of pipe dream, but today actually represent the reality and it's you, you, you young folks who are going to both uh, benefit by these technologies, but you're going to be the people who take these technologies and solve some of those uh, awful problems that mankind has and create what I call the, the best of times. And then most important for you, it'll create jobs. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so that's our that's our three speakers for today. Um, before I introduce uh, Kendra's class here, uh, I'd just like to, to invite anyone that's watching online that you can submit uh, questions on Let's Talk DNA. Let's see, I think um, people are already doing that right now, which is great. Um, so Kendra, uh, I'll turn it over to your class if you guys want to introduce yourself and maybe get started with the first few questions. Everybody, uh, my name is Julia. I'm actually a grade 12 student. Um, Ms. Spire is not actually here today, so I'm acting in her place as our moderator. Uh, so the first question is actually one I have for um, you, uh, the last speaker. You were talking about microbes fertilizing fields and reducing greenhouse gases, and I was wondering specifically how using these microbes would eliminate greenhouse gases exactly. So, so what, one of the things that we need in our in our in our farmland. We need uh, 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 nitrogen and we need uh, phosphates. And we get these from mining things like, uh, like potash. And so we go into the mines, we dig the mines, we have a tremendous amount of energy 
uh, require to, to, to mine that potash, and then we spread it on, our, on the fields. Uh, some of it goes to help the plants, and a lot of it is actually drained off into our lakes, causing, causing even more pollution. So what if we could have, and we're developing these things, specific microbes that bind phosphate and nitrogen, some of which they can even get from the air, and directly fertilize the plant without requiring the expensive, energy expensive uh, phosphates and nitrogen. So that's a, that's a very simple example. And people are working on that right now. And of course, these microbes are, are genetically engineered, so they don't do anything other than take nitrogen from the air and deposit in the plant. Thank you very much. Just as a quick uh, supplemental to that question, I just came up with something else. Uh, a big thing with fertilizers is runoff into the water. Would this eliminate that, or would we still have the same amount of runoff of phosphate into it, the water? It was eliminated entirely because all of, all of the phosphate, as an example, would simply go directly to the plant and enhance the plant growth, and there would be no, uh, or, or, or almost no, uh, uh, excess phosphate around to, to run off into our lakes and rivers. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Is there another question from the, from the class? Um, I have another question. Um, this is going back to when we were talking about iGEM and the iGEM Paris and how they were developing the microbes that would, we could replace deodorant. And so I think what I understood was that these microbes will emit a pleasant scent, but I was wondering how exactly you'd get that to apply to humans and if there's any negative impacts that that could have. Okay, Katarina, do you want to take yeah. that one? So um, that was sort of a downstream potential application of the project. Um, so what, what happens is that the unpleasant scents that we have right now are a result of the organisms on our skin microbiome the enzymes that they use for metabolism as a byproduct, they produce these unpleasant sets. So the actual things, or I guess the parts that this project did was they, they um, engineered enzymes that instead of emitting the unpleasant set as a byproduct, they would emit the pleasant set. So in theory, um, what you could do is you could engineer the bacteria so, like I was saying earlier, these plasmids can be inserted into bacteria, such as the bacteria in, on your skin microbiome. So, in theory, you could potentially uh, transform these plasmids into the microbiome of your skin and then have these enzymes produce the pleasant sense. But, of course, um, it's a downstream application that is very far away. Um, I guess it's potential in the future, but right now um, it has yet to be possible. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. I understand that I, I kind of thought in fear that it would be a very theoretical concept. I was just wondering if any further uh, thinking had been done. And I believe those are all the questions that we have as we unfortunately did join in late. So we'd just like to thank you very much today for sharing all the information with us and we really appreciate it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we've got a couple online questions that I'll, that I'll get to. Um, so uh, the, the first one here is from Harris Guna from O'Neill Collegiate Vocational Institute in Ontario. Um, so th this is kind of broadly to the panel. Anyone that's, that, that wants to weigh in, please feel free. So what are some of the solutions in synthetic biology will be able to provide as a product commercially? And will these products have their progress limited by pharmaceutical companies who will have losses due to these products? Mark, do you want to take this? Sure, I'll give you two examples. Uh, there's a company in, in Ontario that's uh, uh, creating better tasting tomatoes through synthetic biology. Some of us may remember when tomatoes were really tasty, now sometimes they're, they're pretty dull tasting. Well, uh, this company in, in, in Ontario is putting the taste back into, uh, into the tomato using synthetic biology. Uh, on the pharmaceutical side, in fact, synthetic biology is a, a huge uh, benefit uh, to the pharmaceutical industry because they can now make pharmaceutical products, as an example, vaccines, uh, using synthetic biology rather than the uh, extremely complex uh, chemistry that they've used until now. Uh, so uh, pharmaceutical industry and many industries are in fact in, in embracing 
synthetic biology in a major way. I'll quickly follow up uh, on that, on Mark's comments. Uh, I just wanted to mention that it's also an exciting time because synthetic biology and the tools that are now available and that are being developed very rapidly make it a lot less expensive for people to start prototyping new ideas and new products and new projects. And uh, I, th I think this means that the, the number of products and solutions that are going to be available will be uh, broadened and it might look a little bit more like the software industry does today where a lot of big companies acquire startups and young companies for their teams and for their products and and so uh, pharmaceutical companies will probably be looking to new and young and excited innovators like uh, the students on, on this call to be creating the next big products and they'll probably actually buy companies in order to diversify their portfolios and and uh, maybe even change uh, industries that they curr currently exist in. So I, I think uh, uh, I follow Mark's sentiment in that it, it's looking like it's going to be a bright future. Okay, thanks, Justin. Uh, I'll move on to the, the next online question. This is Paul from St. Francis High School in Alberta. Uh, so the question is, are bioreactors involved in the synthetic biology approach to synthesizing the precursors of plastics and fuel from crop waste? If so, what are the present conditions? Can waste from the forestry industry be used? Anyone want to field that one? So I can jump in. I'm not an expert in this area, but there, that's one of the core ideas behind synthetic biology is taking waste, whether it be from various plants uh, or from the pulp and paper industry uh, or from other industry and reformulating it into uh, useful, new and useful end products. Um, so I would just say that, uh, yes, bioreactors are used. Uh, and as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, part of synthetic biology is thinking of cells as little micro factories. And uh, so long as you can identify a precursor that could be a waste product uh, from a different process, uh, and you engineer the cell to accept that uh, and be able to modify it, then you can create uh, a new useful end product. So uh, again, while I'm not an expert in this area, I'm pretty certain that this is happening in, in general agriculture. We know it's happening with uh, sugar, for example, from corn, uh, but uh, that's a very exciting area in, in Canada, especially because the pulp and paper industry creates a lot of waste. So that's a great question. Thanks, Justin. I, like yourself, I'm not an expert either in this specific area, but uh, that's happening um, right here in Ontario. There's a lot of work going on in that. So there's a, a company called Comet Bio Refining that's doing just what the question asks. So taking corn waste, corn cobs and leaves, not the actual food. So it's not using any of the food. It's converting that to sugar. And then, like Justin said, you've got your, your basically your programmable bacteria or, or yeast that can make plastics or a whole myriad of chemicals. Um, the forestry industry is doing the exact same thing, trying to convert um, waste pulp, for instance, um, to, to do the same. So that's a really, really exciting area of synthetic biology and, um, and uh, something that's going to keep growing, I think. Um, I'll, I'll check back in with, um, with Kendra's classes. Does, does anyone else have any questions now that you've had a bit of time to, to think? Uh, seems like you're having some, uh, we can't hear you. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, yes we can. Okay, awesome. So our next question is coming from one of our grade 12 students, Elizabeth. Uh, we were wondering if there are any significant obstacles in your field that you see coming up or dangers. I'm not too sure if you heard that. So the question was if you see any um, potential dangers or significant obstacles coming forth in your field. Okay, great. Thanks for, for clarifying. Justin, do you want to, you have something to say? Yeah, sure. I can weigh in on that one. Uh, so in every industry, there are obstacle, or sorry, obstacles. Um, one of the main obstacles is accessibility. 
of being able to actually practice genetic engineering and synthetic biology. And when we look at other industries, we can see uh, that it, it took quite some time for the technology to trickle down and diffuse into the hands of um, you know, even undergrads or high schools, uh, computers being a good example. It wasn't until the 90s when we started to see computer rooms enter high schools and such. And right now in the world of synthetic biology and genetic engineering, uh, many of you probably if you continue on in, in STEM and in biology, you won't be able to do hands-on genetic engineering for a few more years until you reach university. And so I would say that one of the obstacles right now preventing people from uh, participating in this exciting area is that the tools aren't prevalent. They're not, they're not already available uh, for use in schools. Um, on the opposite end of, uh, of that is, are, are some of the dangers. So, uh, you can ask the question of, okay, let's say these technologies that help you to do genetic engineering become more prevalent and we're able to learn about genetic engineering and synthetic biology uh, in, at a younger age and in a non-traditional environment like in a classroom or uh, in your home or in your basement or your garage, uh, what dangers do those prevent to, uh, for uh, national security, for example. And uh, while we don't need to dive into that right now, um, I'm sure you can brainstorm in your classes um, the importance of making sure that the science uh, that's, that's going to come about in the coming years um, being practiced in schools and basements is done transparently and it's done in open communities. And, and I should maybe just uh, briefly mention do-it-yourself biology is a very exciting new movement around the world where communities of people and students uh, are hanging out in labs, in open public labs, uh, such as in Toronto, DIYbio.toronto.to, uh, and uh, it's a great place to learn out in the open and, and kind of lay everything on the table and, and, uh, and yeah, learn together. I guess maybe just to add to that, another maybe obstacle that some would see it as a necessary obstacle is, is the need for, I guess, regulation. Um, there is quite a lot, as you might know, of contention regarding synthetic biology and people fearing the dangers related to synthetic biology. Um, and I think uh, due to that, there are quite, um, I guess, um, large demands for regulation in terms of what actually gets out there. And that might mean that it will take a bit of time for certain to actually get into the hands of the public. Maybe just quickly following up on, on that comment. Uh, so it's important to note that there, there is already regulation in place, especially for the medical industry. So if you uh, want to work on a project that involves medicine, uh, then there's substantial regulation. And uh, this goes beyond synthetic biology into the pharmaceutical industry and such. The next most regulated industry is agriculture uh, because when you're putting things into the environment, open in, in, into various ecological uh, areas, you need to be careful and cautious about how you're affecting those environments. The, the one area of biotechnology and synthetic biology which is the least regulated and it's uh, it has very little regulation, in fact, is the industrial biotechnology area. And these were, uh, this is uh, in relation to many of the questions that came up. This is um, using feedstocks uh, or uh, products from other industries, waste products from other industries, and turning those into important and useful new products, uh, usually within the confines of big bioreactors. So they're all contained and they don't really affect the environment and they're not used for medicine. So that's an important thing to consider uh, as, you, as you think about projects you might want to do using synthetic biology. Okay, we definitely keyed up on a, on a hot button issue here, and I'm going to give Mark a chance to... No, Mark, you're okay? Okay, great. Well, thanks very much. That, that was really um, a good, good discussion. Um, I'm going to turn to, a, to an online question here. Um, this is Paul from St. Francis High School in Alberta. Uh, so Paul asks, uh, would bacteria synthetically modified to combat infections be susceptible to pathogen resistance? 
as currently seen with many of today's most powerful antibiotic pharmaceuticals. Anyone want to tackle that, that question there? Sure. Uh, I think the key issue here is the, uh, the bacteria that you're going to, uh, you're basically going to synthesize these bacteria and you're going to be able to uh, produce them uh, in, in such a, a specific way that they actually carry out only a single function. And you're, you're going to be able to protect them, you're going to be able to put in things like suicide genes into the bacteria so they don't do anything yet, they don't get into the environment if that's an issue that you're concerned about, so that you have uh, virtually complete control over the genetics of the, of the specific bug and uh, basically con control its destiny entirely. Great, thanks Mark. Anyone, anyone else want to weigh in here? No? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a selfish question for myself here to, to, to Katarina. So you talked about uh, iGEM and all the cool stuff that, um, that, that's been going on with that. Can you talk a little bit about how people can get involved, whether it's already now in high school or how you can get involved when you go to university? Can you just chat a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, other than university undergrad teams, high school is actually, there are actually high school iGEM teams. So um, if there are certain high schools that are interested in starting up their own iGEM teams, that's certainly a possibility, and iGEM does support that. Um, but if there are people who want to get involved in high school, regardless of that, um, each university, like I said, does have their own um, summer camps, where we try to recruit people to just run some basic um, synthetic biology experiments. And then other than that, in terms of outreach, um, some teams have, um, like last year, IGEM Toronto, we had a biohacks where we invited people who were in programming um, to participate and maybe learn a little bit more about the computational side of synthetic biology. Um, but it definitely, IGEM always welcomes people who are in high school who are interested and just want to learn about synthetic biology in general. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks very much for, for talking about that. Um, I'll check in again with um, with Kendra's class to see if there are any any more questions there. Kendra's class, are you still there with us? Okay. Um, okay. We'll move to another online question here. Um, so this is from Carly Davis and Trinity from O'Neill Collegiate Vocational Institution in Ontario. Uh, so their question is: Given that synthetic biology is related to GMOs. How can this prove that they are or are not beneficial to human health? Anyone want to talk about Mark? Do you have a well? Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna uh, have to do the testing, and if you test with any food or any any medical device or any medicine, you're gonna have to show that the GMO or the synthetic biology derived whatever uh, is safe, safe to humans, uh, safe to the environment. And if it works, and if it doesn't work or it's not safe, then it shouldn't be uh, then it should be released. Uh, there's a tremendous hysteria, of course, around gen genetically modified organisms or genetically modified foods that is largely invalid. But that's not the point. The point is that we have to determine their efficacy and their safety before they're released, and we'll do that. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, I, I think that Kendra's class is still with us. I just got a message there right here. Is your mic working? Can you, uh, you have a question for us? Oh, we still can't hear you. Sorry. Okay, we'll wait for you to to uh, to, to type your question to us and. Um, I, I want to ask Justin and Julie. You kind of you showed your 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 kit there um, to kind of do some uh, some synthetic biology at home. Can you talk about? I mean, can I go online? Can I buy this? Or how how, how can how can people get access to this to, to kind of get hands on experience with with doing this type of stuff? Yeah. So I think actually um, our kits relate to this GMO question because 
Uh, my background is design, and uh, up until three years ago, I had no idea what synthetic biology or GMOs were, except what I read in the papers, which is uh, mostly negative, right? So um, I think that part of how we're going to address the question of GMOs in the upcoming years is by understanding it personally. So what actually even is a GMO, and are they good for us? And um, so there's a, a lot of misinformation through the media, and I think one of the best ways to learn about a subject is hands-on, which is one of the reasons um, I created the Amino when I was at MIT. And so we have these kits that allow you to have, it's sort of the hello world of synthetic biology, where you create bacteria that changes color, like these ones that we showed earlier. And you can buy those online, it's amino.bio. And um, you can make them either at home if you're in Canada or North America and they're completely safe. We give you everything to discard of it properly and we also teach you about security. So should you wear gloves? Why are you wearing gloves? Where should you do this in your house? And how do you kill an organism once it's modified? All our organisms are also biosafety level one, which is the non-regulated least dangerous uh, level, which means that it's non-toxic to humans. And so we have the hardware that also comes with it. So one of the issues when starting in bioengineering, synthetic biology, if you're a beginner, is that you don't know what to order and you also don't know how to use the equipment. So we've made simple to use machines, which are, um, I see them similar to the Easy Bake Oven. It's like your first machine, it's uh, $300 or so. So it doesn't matter if you break it, as opposed to lab equipment that can be in the thousands of dollars, which is a little bit more concerning if you break that, although they're quite durable our machines. And so, yeah, so we have the equipment, but we also have the kits, which are $33, and you can do using things from home, like a microwave. Um, yeah, so it's quite easy to get started today. Okay, very, very cool. Thanks for, thanks for giving us those details. Um, I'm gonna go back to an online question now. This is from James from O'Neill Collegiate Vocational Institution in Ontario. Uh, so James is asking, what are the possibilities with synthetic biology in relation to creation and use of artificial tools? For example, a mechanical wrist implant to fix mobility issues. Anyone want to talk about that? So like, I guess you, know, you wouldn't use synthetic biology necessarily uh, to, uh, to create a mechanical tool mechanical wrist, <coughs> but you might use it uh, to be able to uh, uh, coat that mechanical wrist or mechanical arm to allow the, uh, the, the surface of, the, of that arm to be more compatible with the biological tissue. And that's being done uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, the other area, of course, is, is the use of stem cells uh, to enhance uh, damaged uh, tissue or damaged joints. Uh, and, and those studies are, are going, on, uh, going on around the world. Uh, using stem cells, which are not necessarily derived from synthetic biology, or stem cells that are in fact derived through synthetic biology techniques. So, so those are very important areas and, and very actively investigated. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, okay, so go to a class from, from a question from Kendra's class. Um, so this is, uh, this is talking about the, the, the virus that, that targets and eliminates cancer. So the question is, what would happen with that virus once the cancer is fully eliminated? Would the virus then remain in your body and could it have negative effects on your health? So I can weigh in on that one. Uh, so a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, it's estimated that the human genome is roughly about 5% viral DNA. So over the million, millions of years that humans have evolved, uh, or maybe even billions if you look way back, viruses have been a, a key part of evolution and changing DNA um, from organism to organism, uh, swapping DNA between organisms, etc. cetera. So uh, from that perspective, uh, if we were to use an oncovirus, for example, to eliminate a cancer, uh, it could eliminate that cancer, and it may just reside 
uh, within our genome and it may never become activated again. It may have no future role whatsoever. Uh, but there's uh, a lot of unknowns when it comes to these things that you have to be careful about. So for example, by, let's say, inserting uh, something into our genome using a virus, something as simple as that extra spacing that you create within the genome can have a downstream effect. Uh, and so it's uh, synthetic biology and genetic engineering is a very interesting discipline because there are a lot of possibilities and, and the ability to create a lot of amazing solutions, but there's still a lot of unknowns. The beauty, the beauty of synthetic biology, however, is that you could uh, design the, the virus in an absolute way where all it does is kill the tumor and it can have on-off switches where if it doesn't find the tumor within a, a fraction of a minute or it's exposed to some other bodily fluids that the uh, off, off uh, switch uh, occurs and, and the virus is simply destroyed. So the theoretical aspects of, of, of synthetic biology in, in production of viruses are really, really exciting and really unlimited. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so I think we probably have time for one more one more question here. So this comes from, from online as well, from uh, uh, Emil from Nicholson, Nicholson Catholic College. So understanding that ethics remain to be an issue in this regard, have you reached the point of being able to program certain phenotypes like hair color, eye color, or height in fetuses? Anyone want to uh, weigh in on this kind of tricky, tricky question here? Sure. Uh, well, for all of you who are listening who haven't seen the movie Gattaca, it is a must-watch. It's a 1990s movie with Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman, and it's about this future where we are able to engineer phenotypes in humans and eradicate disease and, and various things. And uh, that movie raises a very important question uh, about how the structure of society changes. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, but definitely try and watch that movie. Uh, to more directly answer the question, uh, we're just starting to uh, understand uh, a lot of the more complex uh, regulatory systems, such as eye color. Uh, eye color uh, requires many different genes. It's not just a single gene that regulates eye color. Uh, hair color and melanin are a little more straightforward, so you can probably start engineering traits uh, with simple pigments like that. Uh, but we're still very much in the early days, and part of this is because there's been very limited uh, research on human beings themselves. So it was only last year that the first engineered uh, human project uh, occurred and was announced in China. And it was either earlier this year, January, February, or it was very late last year in America where there was a symposium held to discuss the engineering of humans for certain disorders and disorders alone. So these are not cosmetic uh, traits that are being currently discussed uh, and that's that's as far as much as I know um, if you want to look into this further there's a book that's really good it's called choosing children and it's a few years old now but it really addresses the ethics of it not in terms of height or hair color although it goes into this but it's really about what happens when we start to engineer disabilities or what we think of as disabilities and how does that change the human race as a whole? What, so, so it's what, called what? Choosing Children. I don't remember who it's by, but it's quite a short read. It's a good book. It's not just an issue of ethics. It's an issue of, uh, of regulations and, and, and how governments will regulate these technologies. So. Uh, I, I would be terribly concerned if uh, a government uh, restricted me from uh, genetically engineering uh, a, a fetus to, to get rid of a specific disease. On the other hand, I would be concerned about a government that did not regulate uh, uh, my desire to have my uh, son be seven foot two and play for the LA Lakers. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I think the issue of, of regulating these things is very important, but the regulations must not stifle progress. 
And to quickly add on to that, it, it's sort of a slippery slope. That was a great point, Mark. Uh, but it's a slippery slope, right? Once the technology is out there, different countries will have different regulations and naturally some innovation will uh, trickle to uh, the countries that have less regulation or perhaps there will be some sort of underground uh, market for these sorts of uh, regulated uh, projects. So uh, it, it's definitely Pandora's box and it's a slippery slope uh, and that's why the discussion uh, that we're having is, is so important right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I think we're just about out of time, and this is obviously a discussion that, that is going to keep on going um, here as, as technology moves at such a rapid pace. So I just want to thank everyone um, who attended today's event online. Thank you to the presenters who took time to talk about synthetic biology. Um, anyone that wants to, to see a recording of this can find it online at Let's Talk, uh, Let's Talk DNA .ca. Um and you can also uh, find a, a variety of other resources from Let's Talk Science online. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great day.